Uh, well, kia ora and good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first uh, video interview around our post-COVID vision series. We're really fortunate this morning to have the Honourable Chris Farfoy, the Minister of uh, Broadcasting. I better read this out because it's long, Communications and Digital Media. There are some others as well, and I maybe we'll go into those at another time, but um, thank you very much. Um, I've been really taken by this statement, and I've, I've shared it around that crisis is not just a disruptor, it's an accelerator. And so these interviews are very much around how can we um, be ready or, or take what we've done and really build more. I mean, I think we've been incredibly fortunate with uh, the networks and the investments that we've made to date. And uh, so we came through COVID pretty well. Um, but this morning I'm talking to um, Chris Farfoy about his vision for his portfolios in the post-COVID world. Now, Chris was elected as a member of parliament for MANA in November 2010. And many of us will know of him um, through his work as a journalist at TVNZ and BBC. Um, as Minister for Broadcasting, Communications, Digital Media, um, statement he's committed to bridging the digital divide to allow consumers and businesses to benefit from tech and to ensure that New Zealand culture is reflected in broadcasting. Kia ora Chris. Kia ora Craig, good morning everyone. Good morning. Hey look, so I'm going to ask a few questions around your portfolios. Let's start with um, broadcasting and media because it's uh, a really interesting area and the first question I've got for you is what do you see as government's role, particularly making sure we have a strong media? We've got lots of over-the-top companies now, particularly siphoning off their advertising revenue. Um, and in light of that, have you seen any interesting funding models overseas that we might implement here? Yeah, look, it's, it's a challenging time for the media sector. It was um, pre-COVID as well, Craig, as most people watching uh, the webinar would know. Um, as you alluded to, um, those fangs uh, were um, allegedly taking their advertising away from the traditional um, uh, mainstream media. Um, so we were under a little bit of heat as a government to try and address that. Um, Pre-COVID, um, our main focus was on ensuring that we had a strong public media. So um, earlier this year, we announced our plans uh, for a new entity that, which would uh, come together out of what we know as Radio New Zealand to Television New Zealand now. Obviously, COVID has changed that because um, it is uh, the advertising revenue, as you say, um, has gone, uh, not gone, but has been depleted. Okay. Um, so um, everyone is feeling the pinch even more. So um, back in April, which seems like a long time ago, we had announced that $50 million first phase of funding to help some of those um, media entities through. And we think it has helped, um, but certainly finding a new, a more sustainable model um, for um, all media in New Zealand is what we're after. Um, we need to make sure there's lots of voices, etc. Um, and I think um, with the way that the, the sector was going, we, we could have had some rather large companies uh, fall over. But I think between the beginning of the COVID um, era and now, um, things have started to solidify with the likes of stuff being um, bought uh, essentially by uh, the staff, staff at stuff. Um, what we see our role is in, in supporting new sustainable models and importantly, um, supporting the function of journalism in New Zealand. Uh, so we talked about that. Um, there's um, a project uh, at the moment called the Local Democracy Reporting Project, which is uh, very small and run by Radio New Zealand, but it is supporting local uh, reporting. Uh, and we'll look to, to beef that up in some way uh, when we get um, the budget and the headspace to do that. We're talking about that um, at, at the moment, but it, uh, making sure that um, we have a function democracy is pretty important. Um, it's, um, you know, New Zealand's seen as a pretty safe country and uh, having a, a media Christian people like me to make sure that we're doing the right thing is, um, is uh, an important part of, of that. Um, I think COVID and the way that people were accessing the, the, the media was important um, uh, and a lot more people are, as well as using traditional television and radio, are certainly accessing more information. If you ask the media companies, um, the demand has gone through the roof, but the revenue is falling through the floor. So we've got to find a, a better way to support media. And I think that connectivity is a pretty important part of that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I should have mentioned that if you're participating in the call, you can place a question if you want to ask the minister something. We'll try to get one or two of those in at the end. Um, and what I have done also is allow people to vote questions up at, in today's session. So in the Q&A section, you can put those in. So we'll see what comes through. I think you made a couple of really important points there. Um, Particularly around, um, you know, voices and extra voices, and um, we won't get into fake news. We just won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, just coming back to, you know, something that's been a bit more traditional, and that's, you know, obviously connectivity is not just about pipes in the ground and broadband, but it's about being able to see broadcast and broadcast television. And, and I think during COVID, you know, that technology showed its strength again as well, and particularly not necessarily in urban, but certainly in rural. Um, people think that it might be dying, but actually this whole plain old terrestrial television service is quite important. And um, have you got any plans to ensure that people can still access that sort of service? Yeah, and essentially that is to, to not tinker with it and keep supporting it, actually. Um, I think, um, you know, most people are accessing um, uh, broadcast television uh, if they've got Sky or Vodafone TV or through Freeview and I think supporting that for those who um, who either can't afford or choose not to uh, to connect to the internet uh, is really important and I, I, I would agree with you Craig um, uh, you know some of those one o'clock updates with um, the boss and uh, Ashley Bluefield probably some of the highest rating television in uh, New Zealand in the last 20 years um, and again the, the ease and freedom of access to that um, is pretty important um, but I wouldn't undercut um, that um, while we were locked down, uh, you know, the ability of people to watch those updates and get information um, via the internet now is pretty important. Um, I'd be interested to see some of the media companies um, who were live streaming big um, uh, events during that about, um, you know, how many people were accessing it via traditional means mm -hmm. uh, and how many were doing it uh, because of, uh, you know, hooking into their Facebook um, page um, during those times as well. So I think what COVID has definitely done has been a catalyst for people using different modes of getting the same information. Yeah. Um, but I would agree with you that um, when all else fails, um, and it didn't, just to make that point, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, radio and television uh, are still there as, uh, as where people will kind of default to to get their important information. Yeah, just taking that a little bit further about um, this, but also your statement uh, around, you know, bridging the digital divide. Um, I'm trying to use the word digital inclusion these days. And, yeah. and it, how else has COVID sort of changed or accelerated the government's plans to address digital inclusion? And what do you think the industry can do to help that? You know, um, I think there was, there was a catalyst effect there too. Um, we knew going into COVID that um, it was roughly one in five New Zealanders could be considered digitally um, excluded um, we saw um, that um, in the education space where we needed to work pretty quickly to get um, the likes of modems out to families who, who wanted to make sure that their kids connect, could, could, could connect uh, to continue learning um, and the sector was really helpful there. Um, I guess if I think about um, that four weeks of uh, lockdown uh, a lot of things that would usually take um, months and years to happen happened in days and weeks um, to ensure things uh, got done because we didn't know how long we were going to be in that period for. So um, I would like to use the spirit of that collaboration with um, with industries and sectors to, you know, if if we get back to normal settings um, soon, um, that we know we can do things uh, if we're doing it because with the right reason uh, and quickly then we can uh, smash through a few barriers and probably have a few more frank conversations both ways yeah. um, to make sure things are happening. And certainly um, what we know of those communities who are excluded, um, there was a bit of research that we uh, had um, done for us last year. Um, we know who they are, um, but uh, we actually need to get on with fixing it. Um, and it will just perpetuate um, the social inequities if we don't. Um, and I think um, COVID was another reminder of that. So whether it be uh, Māori or Pacifica or elderly or those who are in state homes or those who are in rural or remote areas, connectivity um, for the future of the economy and the future of um, families is extremely important. So um, I, I think as well as um, you know, investing money and resources into that, I think we need to take the attitudes that we had um, in the early stages of COVID to make sure that things happen. Yeah, I think... Um the connectivity issue is obviously critically important, being people being able to be connected. But there's also, you know, those other elements. Uh, like, I'm sure you've been thinking about this, you know, people actually being able to have a device that they can connect with, understanding how it's used, and the actual digitalization of government um, is driving people down that track as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, some of the things that we hope to do um, at the grassroots level to allow people to have the device in front of them to do things. There's, there's been a lot of good programs that I've even been involved in at the local level, like Computers in Homes, um, 
uh, which have done great work, um, yeah. but when you get a big, um, uh, you know, kick in the, in the guts like COVID, it really shows that, you know, those who, people who don't have the skills or the ability to connect um, really are the ones who suffer the most. So um, I think we, we're going to have a, a good look at that. Um, and um, I think there's some good work already happening um, through the likes of CIP around connecting Marae, et cetera, both in rural areas and urban areas, which can speak to that really um, grass level stuff that needs to happen to ensure that 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 digital divide or that digital inclusion does happen. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Hey, look, um, COVID-19 obviously being top of mind for mo most of us yeah, in this period. And we sort of, well, we thought we were moving out of being having COVID in New Zealand and then we've had a couple of cases, but we'll, we'll, we won't go there. That's not your portfolio. Um, so let's look beyond COVID now and specifically the next three to five years is sort of where I'm thinking about how do you view your portfolios um, strategically supporting, firstly, New Zealand, we'll start with um, supporting New Zealand through the immediate challenge, uh, particularly around, you know, the challenging economic times that we're going to face um, both here and, and overseas. Look, I think if you come look at the basic challenge for some people who are hardest hit, and they might have um, lost a job or lost hours. Um, I think it's going to be pretty hard to either upskill yourself or find a new job uh, if you don't have connectivity. So uh, we've been talking with um, uh, the sector, the telecommunications sector, the TCF, about um, how we can look to support um, people there and some of the wage subsidy um, stuff that we put out in the last couple of days to help meet some of those basic bills we hope will help, but we're keeping a very close eye on the telecommunications part of the average Kiwi family's yep. um, weekly um, uh, bills because you got to you got to eat, uh, you got to pay the rent, um, and if you're looking at some of those utility type um, issues, um, uh, the the mobile bill or the um, broadband bill might be one of the first ones to go. So I'd like to thank the, the sector because we're working quite hard and we're keeping a close eye on it. And if there's a plug, a, a gap to plug, um, we're ready to try and and be able to do that. Um, the other thing I think is don't underestimate the um, uh, the importance of connectivity for um, reinvigorating our economy um, in a different way. Um, just before we started this call, we talked about um, how people um, uh, work habits might change as a result and enable to continue the productivity at the levels we, we want it or to increase it. Um, being able to do things like this um, is extremely important. And if we free up some of that cost in a company, um, uh, for other bills that may have had to have happened um, as a result of travel or or um, or property, um, that will give them hopefully um, the ability to take more people on or, or invest back into the company to do the other things. So, um, you know, we could have um, uh, people dry, dream up, you know, great creative ideas, but I think looking at the basics, um, the, the, the technology m may and probably will enable us to do things differently in order for us to keep momentum up and productivity up in our in our um, in our economy and our communities, but also because we are relatively um, COVID free compared to others, um, people look at our country because um, the regulatory settings are um, are, are pretty solid, um, and we've got a, a workforce that can do things. And if they want to bring work here, then I think again that connectivity and um, making sure people are connected um, can be very useful. So. Building on a foundation, I think, is pretty important uh, before we um, start um, uh, getting extremely creative because I think uh, our UFB and our rollout of the RBI um, puts us in a really good position compared to other nations. Um, I, one of the interviews we're going to do is with the chief economist from Westpac and um, because he's very much banging on this digitalization and how we, we're not going to go backwards. And I actually, I heard him on Radio New Zealand this morning, and he's saying, you know, commerce and shopping has gone online. And uh, one of the reasons why we're doing these interviews is how do we keep that momentum going? And I think, you know, you and I have been around in this portfolio for a while, and it's been a burning question for quite a number of years. We've built these amazing networks. How do we get people to actually use them and take up those services? And COVID was almost uh, an accelerator, wasn't it? It sort of punched people in into doing things yeah it, it, it doesn't matter where you are i'm not sure if anyone from chorus um, is uh, on uh, the line but i think one of their frustrations is that we're building this great ufb network that um that's out to i think roughly 70 80 percent uh, of the country um but roughly only 50 percent people have people have connected um 
um, that's not just a willingness um, for them to connect. I think we had to look at all the issues there because of the enablement of that for uh, their families and them to do uh, work for their companies or start their own business online, I think is huge because we've got a, a pretty good platform and foundation yeah. to work off. Um, and I, I think um, what happens in the next six or 12 months to, to, to enable that to happen is pretty important. And a lot of it, I think, is attitude, actually, um, yeah. depending on what um, companies do. And I think we've got to find the, a balance um, because we don't want everyone to kind of leave a, a city centre. Um, but if, those, if we get the balance right of people being able to work um, from home or be mobile, um, and that unlocks um, some capital or some uh, funding that might, might be more scarce now, then we can keep things going and, and, and potentially in a better way as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so now I want to ask you, um, because obviously we're all thinking, well, most of us thinking, we've got COVID, we're going to get past COVID, then, then there's going to be other things. And, you know, we've got lots of things coming down the track. We haven't even got onto the topics of AI and driverless cars and all those sorts of things. But put your thinking cap on and sort of think about five years time. What digital transformations do you think would have happened and how they might have benefited New Zealand? Um, the thing that I would like to see is, um, I think, as I, as I mentioned, um, the UFB is, is great. Um, by then we'll start seeing 5G come online, um, and I think um, unlocking the potential of that will be great. But I think, I think um, what I hear and what I see when I go around um, rural and provincial areas um, is increased capacity and connectivity there. Um, we've got a primary sector that's pretty important to our economy. Um, and much more um, productivity um, and, I guess, economic, um, environmental sustainability that can come about um, because of that connectivity. Um, and it's nice to see um, we were in uh, Banks Peninsula last week, um, you know, uh, cutting the ribbon on another on another tower. Um, but it's what that enables that's really good to hear and see as a, as a politician um, because the local um, five um, volleys are happy. But also the businesses and the, and the farmers around the area were happy as well. And um, for, for townies, they might not understand that, um, but unlocking the potential in the regions for them to be much more connected um, in an environmental sense um, and, and being able to keep those communities thriving, I think is really important. You know, one anecdote is that you know, the local racing club then could survive because they were struggling to get people out there because they weren't coming out because uh, we're getting mobile coverage now if you think about the importance of a, a racetrack for a small community um, it, it might not mean uh, uh, much to people who, who don't bet in the city but to keep that community together that's huge so um if, if i look forward five years um I, I would like to go to a to, to a, you know pick a pick a spot on the map and go to a real community and for them to be happy that the connectivity uh, there isn't what they need because i think um that divide or, or that inclusion is important uh, for New Zealand. That's a great, great place to um, talk about. We've got our Rural Connectivity Symposium in September and um, we're talking beforehand, we'll, we'll invite the Minister along to uh, speak at that and uh, perhaps he can um, take a few questions on that. Look, um, I know I've only got one, well, in fact, I'm just about out of time. So. In the, I've been doing some other interviews with leaders around their experience in COVID. So I, um, I wonder if I can spring a personal question on you and just say, look, during that period, which was bizarre and unprecedented, did you learn anything personally that helped you get through that time as a leader and, and is going to stand you in good stead going forward? Yeah, I think for my, I, I think it's pretty simple and I think most people would have done this. I think, yeah, your focus had to be very, very precise. Um, we had a, one, a million and one issues coming to us at um, breakneck speed um, and you had to figure out which ones were the most important ones at that time. So, um, Focus. Um, we've got a really good team here, and making sure that um, uh, issues that needed to be dealt with right there and then um, were being done. Um, nothing can prepare you for the velocity of what was going, uh, what was happening in the public service um, during that kind of five or six week period. But um, um, I want to take my hats off to the, the bureaucracy, who always usually get a bit of a hard time. But um, um, the Minister of Finance has got a saying that um, a day is an hour is a day. Uh, a day is a week and a, a week is a year and it felt like that during COVID so um, having having a pretty sharp focus um, was important and I really do think that the people around here and in, in the public service made things happen pretty quick and um, you know I'm not I'm not testing the, um, the Wellington um, bubble but um, speed is not usually uh, one of its strengths. <laughs>
um, but it, but but it moved at, at break speed in, in, in a way that we're now better benefiting from. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, we're out of time. We've had a question come in around extending fibre beyond into rural New Zealand. I'm going to take that offline. I'm going to send it through to you, and then I'm going to ask you to answer it on the 3rd of September at the Rural Connectivity Symposium. Um, okay, I think good. people will be very interested. So, um, thank you very much for your time, uh, Kia ora, and um, we'll um, be talking again. Thank you. See you later.